Donny McManus currently based in Florence, where he runs the Donny McManus Studios. Before moving to Italy in 2008, he was the founder and director of the Irish Academy of Figurative Art in Dublin. He has international experience as a professional artist and has completed numerous important, numerous public mon monuments and private commissions in large-scale bronze. The theology of the body has played an important role in the development of Mr. McManus' work since he came across it while a student at the New York Academy of Art. It became for him a fundamental foundation for his philosophical and theological approach to his visual language. And while based in Dublin, he facilitated several theology of the body study groups. Mr. McManus will speak about the theology of the body and art an exploration of the proper ethos of the body in works of art and about creating a climate favourable to purity. So we welcome Donnie McManus to talk to us. Thank you very much. Um, just, uh, just a small brief introduction. Uh, basically, uh, I noticed on the, on the list of people who were speaking that there was doctors and sisters and fathers. I'm the only mister on the whole list. So I thought, to make up for my inadequacy, I'll put all these titles after my name. <laughs> On top of that, as they, they really exist. It's not my primary school and secondary school. <laughs> so, underneath here, uh, at the very bottom, you'll notice that um, I've made a very specific uh, delineation. What I'm going to show in this slideshow is basically just John Paul II. Uh, later on, there's, there's something which will be entitled an art exhibition, which really will be a slideshow of my work here. Uh, because all, nearly all my work is in permanent sites about the world. So it's hard to transport all these bronzes here. So it's, it's practically impossible. So what I've decided to do is to do a slideshow and put all this stuff together. So this talk is just on John Paul II. And to make it as clear as possible uh, what's John Paul II and what's me, what I've done is, uh, as you see on the bottom there, all the normal and bold print are direct quotes from the Theology of the Body by Pope John Paul II. And the italics and notes uh, are, are notes, paraphrases, and grammatical links made by myself. So just to make it flow better, all right? So just to start, there's 22 points in this talk. Um, and it, I did it so that it would fit on both sides of an A4 sheet. So, but unfortunately, we didn't get uh, to photocopy them beforehand. So those who are interested, uh, I'll leave that there, and they can photocopy after if they want. OK. So just to start off, the uh, first thing I'm going to be dealing with is I'm going to use this image throughout the whole slideshow, which is an image of a sculpture by Canova uh, in the Villa Borghese, the Galleria Borghese in Rome. And it's a neoclassical sculpture. And uh, that's, uh, that's the sculpture there. And this is a, a photograph of a lady in a similar type of pose. Uh, and what I've done is it, uh, this will come, become evident why I have a photograph of a sculpture and a lady together, because it clarifies a number of the points that I'll be going through. So the first point uh, we see is we cannot consider the body an object, an object of reality outside the personal subjectivity of man because we are too bound up, too deeply bound up with the meaning of the prototype. In other words, the, the, we are, because we are also human beings, we have to be very aware that our, rea our relationship with other images of human beings is very intimate because we relate on many levels as well as sexual level to other images of human beings. So we are very deeply bound up with that original. 
The body always remains a model undergoing specific elaboration on the part of the artist, but an object of re uh, but as an object of reproduction in photograph and film. So this is just to elaborate the, the difference between a work of art, painting, sculpture, or drawing, and a work of uh, photography or film, which is more mechanical. So as an artist, when I make a sculpture, for instance, as Canova here made this sculpture of this lady on the right, he is bringing his understanding of woman to the sculpture. So he has a model, could have been very similar to this model here, but it's quite, quite clear that the model is completely different to the actual sculpture. So he's bringing his neoclassical ideas, neoclassical ideals of beauty to the sculpture. Okay, so he's, he's taking the, the model and elaborating it with his understanding. So art essentially is another language. It's, it's just another language like English or Italian or French or whatever. So the most, most important thing is to have the, to understand art, in order to understand the art of different traditions and different cultures, you must understand the philosophy and theology of those cultures, the thought, because all language comes from thought, including the visual language. So here you see very clearly, you see the, the, the sculpture is elaborated by the artist and this is a, also a photograph. We are looking at a photograph and this photograph is of a lady sitting down. And this photograph has limited ability to, limited artistic ability because it's mechanical and it's not processed as much as the artist processes the, 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 the model through his elaboration through clay or marble or paint. Okay. Artistic production is going outside the original and for the body its specific configuration of interpersonal donation. A talk, a taking, a taking possession which does not mean that the human body in its nakedness cannot become a subject of a work of art, but only that this problem is not purely aesthetic, nor morally indifferent. So essentially what's happening is that the specific configuration of interpersonal donation is the, the, the proper place for the human body. But in artistic production, it goes outside of that specific relationship between the spouses. So it, it, it's taking possession of the body in a different way. Now this doesn't mean that we cannot use the body in art, but it does mean that we have specific, it's not, it's not just limited to aesthetic aspects, it's not limited to how beautiful it is or how ugly it is, but it also has a moral aspect. So we have to re realize the moral power, the moral potential of the body. Refining personal human sensitivity is certainly a factor and fruit of culture. That original shame, known already from the first chapters of the Bible, is a permanent element of culture and morals. It belongs to the genesis of the ethos of the human body. So refining human sensitivity is very, very important. And we can see this in contemporary culture very clearly, where there's an increase in pornography uh, and crudeness uh, in language and uh, in entertainment. We feel... Uh, 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 it feel that there's, a, there's just a numbing of our sensitivity. Uh, I know I live in Florence at the moment. The first time I moved there, I made a very big mistake. I found this really cheap property in this area, <laughs> and I should have known better. But uh, I had ended up, uh, I had limited Italian at the time, but I ended up, ended up uh, one door, a, my, my door was in the middle, and on the left-hand side there was a, a, a adult store which they call a sexy shop, it's kind of strange name, a sex shop. And on the other side was a gay sauna. 
So I found myself in between the two, and, I, and here I was teaching theology of the body in, my, <laughs> in between the two. So it was quite ironic. I mean, uh, I'm a member of Opus Dei, and, and, and our, our thing is to is sanctification in the middle of the world. I couldn't get more in the middle of the world than <laughs> teaching theology of the body between a sexy shop and, 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 uh, and a gay sauna. But anyway, so, but it's one thing I realized while I was there is that after a year there, it just, oh, just numb. You just felt, you felt this weight of, of sin around you. And uh, it, it really does weigh down on you. And the more sensitive your soul is, the more it weighs on you. Uh, so it is a very, it is a real, re it's, it's a reality which we have to acknowledge and try to, to, uh, to, to, to help in some way to, 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 to cure the, the, the culture. So this human sensitivity is a fruit of culture. We, ha we need to encourage this, this human sensitivity. Uh, and this all starts in the family with children and so on. And you know, helping children to know what's, what's, what's good to watch and what's not good to watch and what, what magazines are good and what are bad. And not just to say, don't do that, but actually explain why. Uh, okay, so it's, it's also a, the, this original shame is a permanent element of our culture and morals. That, that, that shame is, there, there's good shame and bad shame. And there's good, the good shame it helps us realize that we are not, that we're not, we're not perfect and we, we need to protect ourselves. And uh, so it's a permanent aspect of our culture. And this connected, this connected directly with the genesis of the ethos of the human person, of the human body. Porno vision and pornography. Both take place when the limit of shame is overstepped and when the right to the privacy of the body in its masculinity or femininity is violated. Now, many of you may not be familiar, and very few people outside of this group, I'm sure, are familiar with the term porno vision. Uh, the first time you see it, you think it's some sort of a hardcore Eurovision or something. But it's a uh, porno vision <laughs> is, is, is actually what we are most familiar with. Pornography is actually written, uh, it's, it's it graph graphy, it's written, it's literature that arouses. Uh, uh, and porno vision is, are, are images that are aroused. Okay? So the thing that, we, that, that attacks our computers or whatever, the, and in the magazines, the vast majority of the problems we have with pornography is actually porno vision. So it's, a, it's, a good to, it's, it's good to know these words and to be able to put them in the right context. Uh, so these happen when the, when the limit of shame is overstepped. So when we realize that, that uh, we are see, we're seeing something we really have no right to see because uh, these images are really between Spouses. This, this is an intimacy that only belongs between spouses. And one thing I noticed in, in I was in Rome last week, and uh, was just going through town. And uh, Emperor Armani, the, the designers, have these massive posters of David Beckham and uh, his wife, uh, Posh Spice. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, and there, there are these massive photographs. I mean, the, 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 these photographs are the size of the ceiling. They are absolutely massive, and each of their heads will be the size of one of those cubes. And it, it, they're lying on bed, on the bed or whatever, in their underwear. You know, this is an intimate photograph of of uh, of a, a young couple. Now, I don't feel any right to know and see them in 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 such an intimate situation. It's nobody's business to see these people in in such a situation. But this company, because they pay them enough money, they feel that they have the right to do this. So this is a real numbing in our culture. And this is the middle of Rome. You know, this is, it's, this, we have to be, re, have to be aware that, that, that there, there are really, really tremendous powers behind the promotion of, photo of pornography. And I, I, the, 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 the pornographic business is, I believe, eight times the size, uh, as, as, as strong as Hollywood. 
Uh, you're talking about multi, multi-billion dollar uh, business. So there's this tremendous push behind the promotion of, of, of pornography. So it's good to be aware of this and to expose it for what it is, uh, a cheapening and a violation of our dignity. Another term is, uh, this is the Latin, ob saina, our, our, our priests will probably be able to pronounce it better than me. But this is what cannot be presented to human view without any choice. So in other words, this is kind of the, the image that pops up on your computer when you don't want it. Uh, actually, you should never want it, but uh, that, that you, uh, that this is, this is when, when, you, when you, you don't have any right to see these images and, it, they, they, and they're totally out of context. They only belong between the spouses. In pornography, the body becomes an object of enjoyment intended for the satisfaction of concupiscence itself. It is contrary to the dignity of man also in the intentional order of art and reproduction. So pornography reduces the body to an object of enjoyment. So it's use. And John Paul made this very, very clear that the opposite to love is not necessarily hatred, but use. It's how we use each other. And pornography is a perfect example of using a person and their vulnerability and their sexuality. And it's intended for the satisfaction of concupiscence. It has nothing to do with love whatsoever. And not only does it have nothing to do with love, but it actually destroys the meaning of love. So this, obviously, is contrary to the dignity of man. And that it's contrary to the dignity of man, not only in, in magazines and so on, but also...